Welcome to Moroni's Sunday School Lesson 2. Alright, for this lesson, um, our topic is going to be Are LDS Presidents Prophets? And do their words really trump Scripture? Are they, uh, is it more important really than Scripture? Um, so, uh, first of all, for start, um, when I was a missionary, I don't know how many people I must have told this to, but as we went around and talked to people, we were, uh, you know, always presenting them with the Book of Mormon. And we'd say, look, here's the Book of Mormon. Read it. Pray about it. Um, if the Book of Mormon is true, then you know that Joseph Smith is a prophet. The church is true. And that means it's led by a modern prophet today. So, uh, really, this isn't very good logic. Um, <clears throat> the first part, you know, if the Book of Mormon is true, Joseph Smith is a prophet. That's pretty good logic. I mean, uh, it's possible that he got the book some other way than what he said and and uh, so he wasn't really a prophet but it's pretty safe safe estimation and then if the prophet uh, if Joseph Smith was a prophet then he must have established the church correctly set it up correctly so uh, it's good good bet that the church was true when it was founded right and then uh, but then led by a prophet today that's where it gets really sketchy um, you know, if we build a foundation for a house, just, you know, just because we build the foundation right and then we build the house doesn't mean that at some point the roof's not going to leak. So, it would mean that, you know, the roof's probably going to leak eventually if we don't do the foundation correctly, but not the other way around. Um, so let's imagine we all take a trip to Jackson County, Missouri, and we go get on Interstate 80 and we head eastbound. Well, we got headed in the right direction, right? So we got off to a good start, we packed some sandwiches, we've got enough money to buy gas, uh, we know where we're going to stop to spend the night, we've got everything planned out. But does that mean we'll definitely get there? No, it doesn't. It, we could take a wrong turn somewhere, we could get in an accident, um, uh, there could be some kind of road construction we didn't know about and we get lost. Any number of things could happen. So yes, it's important to get started out correctly, but that doesn't mean we'll end up in the right place. So, clearly the logic there breaks down. Um, so, for most of my text on this, I'm going to go with a talk that Ezra Taft Benson gave years ago. Um, I do believe he was either in the first presidency or a member of the Quorum of Twelve at the time. He, I don't believe he was the prophet. Uh, but this talk encapsulates most of what uh, the LDS people use to justify the idea that the presence of the church are prophets and that their words trump scripture, that their whatever they say is more important than uh, scripture we've had in the past. Now before I get going at Ezra Tap Benson here, let me just say that when I was a young man I had a picture of his on my wall. Um, I wanted to be like him someday. Um, so I consider him uh, a good wise man. Um, However, I'm going to have to uh, pick apart his talk here because some of the things in it were just not exactly correctly worded right or uh, maybe um, not right at all. Um, some of them are, um, but uh, anyway, I'm going to have to uh, tear it apart because it, this doctrine, while maybe was never right, it's gotten disgusting these days and it, it's got to be... Uh, it's got to be destroyed. So anyway, I'm going to start picking at it here. So first of all, the first quote I'm pulling from his talk, and you can find his talk. Uh, I don't, sorry, I don't have the reference for it. Um, the reference I had is no longer exists. But um, anyway, if you look it up, President uh, uh, Ezra Tapp Benson's talk on, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, is the whatever on the prophet. Some of these quotes I'm sure you can find on Google. Um, so the first thing he says, the prophet is the only man who speaks for the Lord in everything. In section 132, verse 7 of the Doctrine and Covenants, uh, the Lord speaks of the prophet, the president says, there is never but one man on earth at a time on whom this power and the keys of the priesthood are conferred. Okay, so I'm not arguing with that. Um, but, uh, 
does that uh, does that make the words that they say, uh, you know, does that make them prophets? Does it make their words trump scripture? So in uh, DNC section one twenty one, um, it says. Behold, there are many called, but few are chosen. And why are they not chosen? Because their hearts are set so much upon the things of this world and aspire to the honors of men that they do not learn this one lesson, that the rights of the priesthood are inseparably connected with the powers of heaven, and that the powers of heaven cannot be controlled nor handled only upon the principles of righteousness, that they may be conferred upon us, it is true, but when we undertake to cover our sins or to gratify our pride or our vain ambition or to exercise control or dominion or compulsion upon the souls of the children of men in any degree of unrighteousness, behold, the heavens withdraw themselves. The Spirit of the Lord is grieved. And when it is withdrawn, amen to the priesthood or authority of that man. Um, that goes for everybody. I don't care who you think you are. It goes for everybody. Um, and it's my contention that, that many of these things, the leaders of the church have done. Um, and so the Spirit of the Lord has been grieved and withdrawn, and there's no priesthood authority. Now, I'm not saying that they don't have uh, the rights to officiate still over some of the ordinances. Um, if, we, if we look, this, is, you know, this case is an unprecedented. The sons of Eli... I mean, they were doing all sorts of terrible things. Um, uh, the Bible's not entirely clear, but something with, uh, they were sleeping with women to, for certain things. Um, they were taking bribes, um, different, uh, anyway, but they were still officiating the ordinances while they were doing all this. The same thing with the sons of Samuel. Um, they were still officiating in the, in the ordinances. And they were taking bribes. Uh, Alma, you know, we read the story in the Book of Mormon of Alma when he was uh, a wicked uh, priest of King Noah. Well, um, after he repents, he, you know, he takes a group of people with him and uh, he baptizes them. Well, where did he get the authority to baptize anybody? Well, he had it while he was a wicked priest of King Noah. And just because he was wicked did not mean that he lost that, uh, that priesthood power. But uh, certainly he was not inspired by God at that time. Um, so they may have that uh, authority to officiate in the ordinances, but they do not. Uh, that doesn't mean they're inspired by God. Uh, the next point that I'm pulling from his talk uh, Wherefore, meaning the church, this is from DNC uh, section 21, 4 through 6 that he's quoting. Uh, Thou shalt give heed unto his words and commandments, which he shall give unto you, as he receiveth them, walking in holiness before me. For his words ye shall receive, as if from mine own mouth, in all patience and faith, for doing these things, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. So... Yeah, that's pretty powerful, right? Um, but further re reading reveals, uh, For thus saith the Lord God, Him have I inspired to move the cause of Zion in mighty power for good. And His diligence I know, and His prayers I have heard. God doesn't say anything about any future presence of the church. He's speaking specifically here about Joseph Smith. And so to sit here and to try to take what is in the Doctrine and Covenants there and apply it to any further leaders of the church is ridiculous because God is speaking about Joseph himself. Now, how could he have already heard the prayers uh, and uh, seen the works of men that didn't exist yet? Or at least on earth, anyways. He couldn't, clearly. So, uh, so that does not apply to them. It applies to Joseph Smith himself. And then... Uh, uh, the third quote we're going, we'll uh, take from uh, President Mintz's talk. Second, the living prophet is more vital to us than the standard works. And now this is a big one because um, pretty much anything that takes place in the church is justified under this idea. 
Um, President Wilford Woodruff tells of an incident, interesting incident that occurred in the days of the Prophet Joseph Smith. I will refer to a certain meeting I attended in the town of Kirtland in my early days. At that meeting, some remarks were made that have been made here today with regard to the living prophets and with regard to the written word of God. The same principle was presented, although not as extensively as it had been here. When a leading man in the church got up and talked upon the subject and said, You have got the word of God before you. Here in the Bible, Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants, you have the written word of God, and the word, and the, you have got the written word of God, and you will give revelations. Should oh, hold on a second here. You have got the words, the word of God before you, who give revelations. Should give I don't know something's I think wrong here with my text. Uh, you have got the Word of God before you here in the Bible, Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants. You have the written Word of God, and you who give revelation should give revelation according to those books, as what is written in those books is the Word of God. We should confine ourselves to them. When he concluded, Brother Joseph turned to Brother Brigham and said, Brother Brigham, I want you to go to the podium and tell us your views with regards to the living oracles and the written Word of God. Brother Brigham took the stand and uh, and he took the Bible and laid it down before him and he said, There is the written word of God to us concerning the word, work of God from the beginning of the world almost to our day. And now, said he, when compared to the living oracles, those books are nothing to me. Those books do not convey the word of God direct to us now as do the words of a prophet or man bearing the holy priesthood in our day and generation. I would rather have living oracles than all the writing in the books. That was the course he pursued. When he was through, Brother Joseph said to the congregation, Brother Brigham has told you the word of the Lord, and he has told you the truth. Okay, so, um, again, pretty powerful. Um, maybe. <laughs> Uh, the standard works contain the words of Christ. Um, does, I don't know, does anything, does anything trump that? I mean, I would have to say that, you know, some of what Brigham Young says there is true. Um, certainly, um, you know, counsel that was given to the children of Israel, uh, in those days cannot clearly be, um, clearly cannot uh, be as valuable as were God to give us our own uh, counsel in these days. So I'm not going to disagree at all with that part. Um, one thing I'd like to point out is President Benson's here is going to, or uh, Ezra Trapp Benson here is going to dead prophets to prove the importance of living ones, which I think is a little bit ironical that he did, couldn't point to something from a living prophet and say, well, you know, this is how we knew it was a living prophet. He had to go quote a dead one to prove how important a living one was. Um, so also I'd like to point out Joseph was present and uh, at that meeting. And so uh, Brigham Young was talking about the man who helped bring forth the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price. Um, so he wasn't standing in front of Russell and Nelson and, and saying such a thing. Um, it, it kind of a fountain versus the bucket thing, right? I mean, so we've got the fountain which is producing all of this water and uh, Brigham Young is saying, I wouldn't trade that for a bucket of the water. Um, no such body of works exists for current leaders. Um, you know, the, where can you point to all the wonderful revelations that uh, Russell and Nelson has given. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of conference talks. We'll get to some of those in our later meetings. But but no such body of works like, like that, which uh, are attributed to Joseph Smith. Um, nothing can trump the words of Christ ever, really, right? I mean, um, those principles which he taught can never be... Um, can never be, uh, you know, trumped by anything. I mean, how can we trump uh, 
love thy neighbor as thyself, and to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, mind, and spirit. Okay, Mormon 9.9. 9. So, um, let me see here. Um, so, for we do not read that God, for do we not read that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever? And in him there is no variableness, neither shadow of changing. So, he doesn't change, and so his word doesn't need to change. Yes, maybe specific things for our time versus another time, but, but his teachings cannot be trumped by anything that, uh, uh, that anyone claiming to be a prophet today has to say. Maybe add understanding, uh, additional uh, helpful hints, but not trumped, not take precedent. Uh, and, and I'll give you an example. In Matthew 6, 19 through 21, it says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So there's no... Uh, Christ there is teaching us something uh, about our own character, right? That where we put our time, our money, our possessions into our treasure, that's where our heart's going to be. And that's not going to change. If, if you put $100 billion into Apple stock and Microsoft stock and uh, uh, whatever, Facebook stock, you know, if the church is valued at $400 billion, that's where your heart's going to be. If you had been putting that treasure up in heaven, then your heart would be there with it. So those principles don't change. I don't care what anybody claims to say. If Christ spoke it, it's always going to be the same. And, and that can't be outdone by some modern leader. Um, Isaiah 55, 8-11 for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my wa your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts in your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow falleth from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and breed to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I send it. So, there's no one doing that. Uh, in four, uh, the living prophet is more important to us. The fourth quote from here. The living prophet is more important to us than a dead prophet. God's revelation to Adam did not instruct Noah how to build the ark. Noah needed his own revelation. Therefore, the most important prophet, so far as you and I are concerned, is the one living in our day and age to whom the Lord is currently revealing his will for us. Therefore, the most important reading we can do is any of the word and do is any of the words of the prophet contained each month in church magazines. Our instructions about what we should do for each six months are found in general conference address which are printed in the church magazine, beware of those who would set up dead prophets against the living ones, for the living prophets always take precedent. Okay, so does anybody think that God sent Noah to tell the people to get on the ark? I mean, really, that's not at all what was going on here. Uh, God sent Noah to warn the people that because they hadn't been listening to the words of Adam and Seth and Enoch and Methuselah, and all of the other prophets up to that time, that he was going to destroy them. The revelation he gave to Noah about the ark was for how to him to get out of being destroyed along with him. Now, does anybody really think that if there were good people living in those days that were keeping all the commandments that had been given to them by Adam and Seth and Enoch and Methuselah, and that they had been going around and they had been loving their neighbors thyself, their self, and treating uh, everyone with love and respect, that God would have said, you know, I'm going to have this art thing, and if you don't listen, I'm going to wipe you all out. Uh, clearly not. 
Well, what happened here was that Noah was uh, sent to give them their last and final warning because they hadn't been li listening to all the dead prophets. <laughs> the truth is, if we're honest in heart and we really want to know what it is that God wants us to know, um, we can find that in living or in dead prophets and, or li if there are current living ones. Um, what's important is, is that where our heart's at um, when we read the scriptures, do we really want to know what the Word of God is, or are we just looking to justify what we already think? Right. President Wilford Woodruff stated, I say to Israel, the Lord will never permit me or any other man who stands as president of the church to lead you astray. It is not in the program. It is not in the mind of God. Uh, president Marion G. Romney tells of this incident which happened to him. I remember years ago when I was a bishop, I had President Heber J. Grant talk to our ward. After the meeting, I drove him home. Standing by me, he put his arm over my shoulder and said, My boy, you always keep your eye on the president of the church, and if he ever tells you to do anything, and it is wrong, and you do it, the Lord will bless you for it. Then with a twinkle in his eye, he said, But you don't need to worry. The Lord will never let his mouthpiece lead the people astray. So this led to all kinds of conjecture in the church. So, uh, you know, God would uh, kill, you know, a president of the church before he let him uh, lead the people astray or whatever. Um, I like to quote something. Again, we're going back to dead prophets, which always, the irony, irony of this always strikes me that we're always going back to dead prophets in order to prove this principle that the live ones are more important. It seems like there's something a little screwy about that. But uh, here's a quote from uh, Spencer W. Kimball, um, another dead prophet at this point. Um, the, the Spirit of God, this is given in, uh, so you can look it up if you want. It was given in the April 1975 uh, General Conference. And uh, he's quoting George Q. Cannon here. And then he asserts that these words were correct then and maybe even more so now. It says, The Spirit of God would undoubtedly be so grieved that it would forsake not only those who are guilty of these acts, but it would withdraw itself from those who would suffer them to be done in our midst, unchecked and unrebuked, and from the president of the church, down throughout the entire ranks of the priesthood, there would be a loss of the Spirit of God, a withdrawal of His gifts, and blessings and his power because of their not taking proper measures to check and expose their iniquity. So uh, you have George Q. Cannon, which I'm not sure I know exactly the time frame of that. I want to say somewhere around the uh, uh, turn of the century, um, eight, late 18, somewhere in there. I could be wrong. Don't quote me. Um, so, but, but very early on in the church's history, uh, 100 years ago or so now. Um, and then you have, again, about 50 years ago, uh, President Spencer W. Kimball saying essentially the same thing. And uh, so if those acts of iniquity, whatever, were not fully rebuked and taken away from the church, then he says that... Uh, there'll be a loss of the spirit even from the president of the church. So I'd have to say, how could the uh, words of a, of a um, as uh, Ezra Taft Benson says here, that the living prophet be more important than the words of a dead prophet if the dead prophet had uh, the spirit and the living one didn't, or less so. Um, so, uh, and as far as this leading the church stuff goes astray, I mean, you can accuse me if you like of uh, mixing with words here, but uh, um, also I wanted to point out that, the, that uh, Joseph, so this chain has to re remain unbroken, right? So if, if these modern men are going to claim that they have uh, the authority to speak for God and their words are more important than past and everything. And we have to be able to trace that back. There has to be an unbroken chain of prophets from Joseph to now. So if 
President Kimball was wrong when he said that, and George Buchanan was wrong when he said that, although he wasn't a president, but high-ranking official, then uh, um, it, it kind of throws all this all out, pa everything past that out as well. Um, but uh, again, it, we have, uh, we have uh, not, maybe not necessarily the church or the prophets leading the church astray, um, uh, anyway, let me, let me get to that in just a second here. Uh, fifth, the prophet is not required to have any particular earthly training or diplomas to speak on any subject or to act on any matter at any time. So, but they all do, right? I mean, these are all lawyers, uh, highly educated businessmen, doctors. Um, they're not, they do have formal education. <laughs> Um, that's all they are. They're like any other group of people you would find on the board of any major company, right? We we don't have any carpenters, fishermen, or farm boys, right? I mean, they're 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 all highly educated men. Um, uh, from Matthew eleven seven through eight, what went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind, but what went ye out for, for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment, behold, they that wear soft raiment are in king's houses. Anyway, just something to think about. What type of men are they? Uh, seven. Uh, the prophet does not have to say, thus saith the Lord, to give us scripture. Um, I, I'm not going to argue with that. Thou, thou hast declared unto us hard things, more than we are able to bear. Um, this is... Uh, uh, Sorry, this is President Benson. I'm quoting again here, and he's quoting from uh, from uh, Nephi, uh, one sixteen through one through one through two. Uh, the guilty taketh the truth to be hard, for it cutteth them to the very center. Uh, said Mary and G. Romney, it is an easy thing to believe in the dead prophets, but it's a greater thing to believe in living ones. And he gives this illustration: One day, when President Grant was living. I sat in my office across the street following a general conference. A man came over to see me, an elderly man. He was very upset about what had been said in this conference by some of the brethren, including myself. I could tell from his speech that he came from a foreign land. After I had quieted him enough so he would listen, I said, Why did you come to America? I am here because a prophet of God told me to come. Who was the prophet? I continued, Wilford Woodruff. Do you believe Wilford Woodruff was a prophet of God? Yes, sir. Then came the $64 question. Do you believe that Heber J. Grant is a prophet of God? His answer, I thought, I think he ought to keep his mouth shut about old age assistance. So the reason I, I quoted this one was, how many times have uh, church members told the presidents to shut up about something, right? I mean, there's been plenty of times when uh, they've given counsel in the past and the members of the church didn't want to hear it and so they just disregarded it or whatever. Well, uh, maybe it's not the presence of the church leading the church astray, but the church leading the presidents. Uh, as, as a scripture we quoted last week from uh, Second Nephi, which is just a, a reprinting from Isaiah, the ancient is the head, so the, the previous members of the church. And they lead the body, and then the prophet that teaches lies falls behind. Um, Matthew 13, uh, 12. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away even that that he hath. So as we, um, we, we lose that spirit as we um, disobey. Um, so, essentially, the church has raised up its own prophets is what's really happened. Um, because they have uh, failed to follow previous counsel, um, they have gotten prophets that won't tell them any, much they don't want to hear or anything they don't want to hear. Um, that, uh, these uh, men have no testimony of Christ. I mean... Uh, yeah, if you want to say I'm being overly critical, fine. But they have no 
special witness of Christ. They say they do, but they don't. Um, I've never heard any of them. They won't even claim that they've seen him, that they know, uh, you know, that that they know uh, what he looks like, that they've uh, uh, spoken to him, and you know, you hear all sorts of excuses for that. Um, in Second Nephi uh, eleven, uh, so where I got here, finally, Second Nephi eleven three. And my brother Jacob also has seen him, as I have seen him. Wherefore, I will send their words forth unto my children to prove unto them that my words are true. Wherefore, by the words of three, God hath said, I will establish my word. Nevertheless, God sendeth more witnesses, and he proveth all his words. So Nephi testifies that he and his brother Jacob had seen Christ. Uh, Joseph Smith's testimony from DNC 76, uh, 22 through 24. Uh, and now, after the many testimonies which have been given of him, this is the testimony, last of all, which we give of him, that he lives. For we saw him, even on the right hand of God, and we heard the voice bearing record that he is the only begotten of the Father, that by him, and through him, and of him, the worlds are and were created, and the inhabitants thereof are begotten sons and daughters unto God. So, where is their testimony? They don't have such a testimony. Um, because they are not the heirs of Joseph Smith. They are not living prophets. They may have been called to become so, but uh, through their over, uh, through their over, uh, whatever, their over uh, indulgence in worldly goods and their, uh, and their uh, uh, need for the praise of, church members and to not be criticized overly by them, they have uh, forsaken that spirit and so lost uh, this the ability to speak for God. Uh, and the church good has come to be defined by what uh, the prophet says. Uh, that's very disturbing to me. Um, there are so many members of the church that will sit there and just, well, I don't know about this, but... You know, the prophet says it, so it's got to be the right thing. And so they put their own understanding and their own uh, personal testimony and own, own personal belief aside and go with the prophet. I know when I was struggling with the, leaving the church, I spoke to uh, several of my church leaders about some concerns that I had. And... Uh, they had no answers for me, but they would always come back with that tired old refrain. Well, that's what the prophet says, you know. Well, I'm here to tell you that when we stand before God to be judged, stand up, stand before him and uh, explain your actions as you having done what you thought was right. I don't think it's going to cut it when we're standing there and we say, you know, this guy told me to do it. <laughs> Um, I think God's going to say, well, don't you have a brain? Uh, didn't I give you the scriptures? Don't you have a conscience? Can't you pray? All of those things. Uh, what You just listen to somebody blindly? I mean, I don't think that's going to uh, be much of an excuse for us. Anyway, uh, that's it for this lesson. Uh, thank you. I appreciate your time. And I uh, look forward to uh, future lessons.